Elizabeth Lesser is the co-founder of Omega Institute and the author of Marrow, The Seeker's Guide, and the New York Times bestseller, Broken Open. She has given two popular TED Talks and is a member of Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul 100, a collection of 100 leaders who are using their voices and talents to elevate humanity. She lives in New York's Hudson Valley with her family. And this is her book, Cassandra, or Cassandra Speaks. Um, basically, she talks in this book, well, I'll let her explain it more. Um, it's a collection of her own thoughts and feelings and responses to how, um, oh, hi. <laughs> Everybody's saying hi, it's so nice. Um, to how history has shown women to not have the most advantageous position in the narrative um, but it's not an angry book at all um, it's thoughtful and considered and Cassandra the myth that she's referencing in the title of the book is because um, I can't remember all the details but something like uh, Zeus gave Cassandra the um, power to see the future but not be able to enact any change or really have anyone believe her um, and in a way that's similar to how some women feel that they know everything and they say it and people don't listen um, so here we go you um I'm gonna with Elizabeth now hi Sam um, and thank you guys for watching ahead of time and hopefully this will work um, there are so many quotes and so many sections that I wanted to talk to Elizabeth about today and the fact that at the beginning of most chapters, she has these little quotes, which I always love. Oh, um, okay. hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> oh, boy. Here I'm I sorry. am. The problem with Instagram Live is that everybody who eventually gets on is completely, like, flummoxed and frazzled because it never works right at first. So I'm sorry okay. about that. Now I'm on my iPad, sitting in my living room. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you for coming on. <laughs> um, your book was so good. Um, I was just, I was showing the people here, like I've dog-eared like every other page. Usually like if I find something interesting, I just turn it and maybe there'll be like two or three things where I'm like, I have to talk to this author about this. And this, in this book, I was like, well, this page and that page. So anyway, now of course you're here. I'm not going to be able to remember what I wanted to ask, but anyway, <laughs> thrilled to talk to you about it. <laughs> um, can you, if you wouldn't mind, for everybody watching, I read your bio already, but if you could explain better than I did what Cassandra Speaks is about and what inspired you to write this book, that would be great. <laughs> you can bring um, in any family members, anyone in the background, totally fine. <laughs> okay, so my husband just walked through the room. Ask me the question again. <laughs> okay, let's do it here. We'll start again. I'll pretend that this is a podcast only. Okay. <laughs> There's a dog barking in my house, too. So uh, my sister-in-law is here with um, my mother-in-law's dog. Anyway, welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so you are the author of Cassandra Speaks, which I told you is amazing. The subtitle, When Women Are the Storytellers, the Human Story Changes. Um, could you please tell listeners what your book is about and what inspired you to write it? Sure. Well... Um, in a way, I've been preparing to write the book my whole life. It's my fourth book, and people often say, how long did a book take you to write? And I'd say, my whole life. Um, <laughs> I, this one, not the other ones. I was, um, I'm the daughter of uh, a feminist mother and a domineering father, and I have three sisters, so four girls. And from my earliest age, I was like, What's going on here? How come men told the story and women's values and who we are, you know, don't also get expressed in our myths, in our movies, in our literature? I studied literature in college. I, I love books like you do. And um, it's not just that so many books that we consider the canon of Western literature are written by men. It's so many of them are... Um, about what men care about. And, and it's not that women also don't care about the hero's journey and adventure and war and sports and things like that. But we also care about things like family and relationships and talking. 
And these get put into like women's literature as if that's a genre, as if women are a genre of writing. So I always wanted to explore what would have happened if women's storytelling had also been valued as much as men's? How would history have changed? How would culture have changed? So I go back into the old stories of Eve, Cassandra, Pandora, Hester Prynne, a lot of the old literature and newer movies. And I also explore the canon of power, books about what is power, like Machiavelli, the prince, and Sun Tzu, and how did we come to define power as what we do? And I also tell a lot of stories about my own life as a mother and a wife and a daughter, because I'm primarily a memoirist, so I can't help but do that, too. Well, I loved those parts. I mean, all of it was super interesting, but I found myself sort of like wanting to fast forward to like, when's the next little snippet she's going to share about herself, you know? (laughs) I know. Isn't that so? Like my first book many years ago was about how um, America was changing the way people did their spiritual searches, sort of the democratization and the diversifying of spirituality. It was primarily... Uh, research, but I told a few of my own stories and people would always say, yeah, that was interesting, but I really liked your stories. So my next book was almost completely memoir um, because I think people, see, that's the point. People learn through stories. And so we've learned everything about humankind through stories written primarily by men. Not that there's anything wrong with male stories at all, but we've left a huge part about what it means to be human out of the human story. And you, um, you show how all the statues are of men, how everything is about war, how even our vocabulary, the way that we talk, like no holds barred, and all these things refer to things that have the, have the meaning of power that isn't necessarily the best meaning of power. And how you even had a- The imbalanced a, meaning of power, yeah. Um, and how we can change it even in the, with little things like the way we use our vocabulary. Um, and I love how you started it off like tiptoeing down like to <laughs> procrastinate and you're going through your son's boxes and finding all his whole canon of literature downstairs where you start going through some of these books. So tell me, what, I mean, you, it was so clear in the book, but just tell people watching how when you were down there and going through the books, you were like, is this, can you even believe that it says this in The Prince or all these other books that you had been opening? Tell me about that moment. Yeah. My, my youngest son went to a college called St. John's College. It's the Great Book School. Um, it's an amazing school where every student reads the same 100 books over four years. That's all they do. They read the Greeks in ancient Greek and they study math through reading Pythagoras and no interpretation. They just read the original texts. And and the students lovingly call it the dead white man's um, curriculum. And so um, whenever I'm trying to do something, especially writing, and maybe you can relate to this and all you writers out there can, uh, the way I procrastinate, because writing is hard, even if you've written a lot, writing is hard, I procrastinate best by cleaning. I love to clean things, closets, my car, and the basement is particularly, uh, according to me, not my husband, disgusting in our house, just tons of old boxes and everything. And I was about to start this new book and I thought, oh my God, I gotta clean something big. So I went into the basement and I started going through boxes and one was a box of my younger son's college books. And I, that was the first box I opened. And P.S. the last box. I just got completely caught up in the box. And so here I was about to start writing a book about women and power and stories. And I start reading through the, these hundred books. And they, I felt so naive. I opened the first book. It was The Prince by Machiavelli. Now, I doubt any of you have read The Prince. Maybe you have. I never had. But I certainly knew some of Machia, I knew his name, and I knew, you know, he said something like the ends justify the means, but that's about all I knew. I start reading this book, and it was shocking. 
some of these quotes about how you do power by by having making sure people are either enemies or follow followers and and he said something like a leader should be feared more than loved i i was just like really why wasn't i informed of this and then i opened sun zu's the art of war same stuff about fear and love being for wimps and and i and there i am in the basement i'm actually sitting in an old rocking chair that i nursed my kids in in a dark basement reading these books about men and power thinking wow wow there actually is a primer for the abuse of power like why wasn't i informed of this and i took all those books upstairs and i made a deep study of the history and the um pathetic way that we've reduced power down to um either uh dominating or aggressing and all the newer forms were just as women come into more power of vulnerability and inclusion none of that's in the old doctrines of power so true um and then of course you led a big retreat which started off small and as you say in the book grew and grew and grew um called women in power and you have all these high powered women come in and strut their stuff and um do everything from getting people away from their phones to regroup to having great speakers so tell us a little more about your women in power conference and how that came to be and what the goal of it is especially vis-a-vis men in power and and the sort of imbalance that exists today. Well, um I'm the co-founder of an organization called Omega Institute, which is a conference and retreat center in Rhinebeck, New York, and um I helped start it in my early 20s. So I've been at the same place for 40 years running this conference center. Even as I say it, I I <laughs> believe it like what i'm not telling the truth 40 years but actually it is and um as such i have organized hundreds of conferences over the years in everything from holistic health to poetry and sports just because it's a holistic learning center all sorts of ways that humans can learn and grow and um as a woman in power i had been aware yet confused and scared about how i was learning the language of how to be a leader with all these men you know and i was grateful for what i was learning strategy and some form of holding my own and uh ways of of being powerful that that i was eager to learn but my way of expressing let's say i was in a leader in a meeting and i was emotional and it was making me want to cry i would stuff that and try to be a guy among the guys like locker room put down or stoicism or whatever and i felt i am losing a whole part of myself to be powerful in many ways i'm losing the best parts of myself my empathy my ability to listen and include my desire to empower people as opposed to dominate people i'm losing that part of myself i don't want to lose that part of myself what do i do help and i looked around there's no one to help me and i thought i'm going to start a one conference and the first conference i organized i had anita hill and eve ensler who wrote the vagina monologues i just picked anybody i could who would be like who are women doing power differently i don't want just women who are out you know out manning the men i i want women who are actually trying to bring some of their best qualities into leadership changing leadership from the inside out not that men bad women good but just like could look the world's a mess we need something new could women do it differently so i brought these first conference in and unbeknownst i mean usually i do one conference on a subject and that's it but people were starving for it women were so hungry just to be in a room and to say things that we can't usually say one thing we can't usually say is i want power like we're not supposed to want power 
And, but I don't want that kind of power. I want a different kind. And, you know, 20 years later, the conference is still a vital, amazing gathering where we've brought women leaders from all over the world in every discipline and astronaut and artists and actors and, and also the women in the audience are so fantastic. So um, a lot of that informed the book, a lot of the keynote addresses I've given ha informed my Cassandra book. I love when you were backstage at the TED talk, who were you with? Um... Madeline Albright or something and like you were all nervous about going out and giving your big talk and um, tell me more about that experience and how you found your way to lead in the way that you wish other people could lead. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving a TED talk and if you'd ever like to um, actually almost have a heart attack, you can, you should, you should give a TED talk because <laughs> <laughs> they have figured out a way to make every speaker incredibly nervous. And I was, uh, the three people who, uh, the person who's about to go on and the next person and the next person all go in the green room at the same time. And so um, the person before me was this amazing speaker who actually founded an amazing organization called A Call to Men which is helping men actually become more vulnerable. And then me, I was gonna give my talk and Madeleine Albright, who of course had been the secretary of state and brokered peace in, in Serbia. And she was so nervous, she was so nervous. And you know, I, I, the reason I told that story and I, is because as the, the founder of Omega, I've had a chance to meet so many powerful people, men and women. And people often ask me, what's, what's the best thing you've learned from being around all these people? And I would say that they're all scared children inside, just like you and me. Like it doesn't matter what's on your resume. It doesn't matter, everyone, everyone has that core, super strong dudes, uh, women, athletes, you know, it doesn't matter. We all have that part. We just all hide it from each other in different degrees of success. And that is a very helpful thing to remember as anyone wanting to do power differently, that part of the skill to me of being a new kind of leader is finding that place in another person. And the best way to find it is to admit our own you know, to, to be our vulnerable selves with each other. And I do believe that is something women have a little more skill at than men do. And it's what the world needs now. Well, this is like validating my, uh, <laughs> my personal confessions on Instagram all the time. So um, you're making me feel better about that. <laughs> uh, another part of why I think you told the story from the TED Talk was that the man who had gone before you talked about how one of the young people he had coached or um, mentored had said that should somebody tell him he threw like a girl, he would have been more than upset. He would have been destroyed by that comment. And you, you were saying, what kind of gender roles do we have if being, if being compared to a girl would make a boy feel destroyed inside when girls want to perhaps throw like boys or whatever else? Um, and what does that say about what, our genders are defined as these days. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. I'm a grandmother now. And right yeah. before I signed on here to Instagram with you, I, I had picked up my eight-year-old grandson at school. You know, with COVID now, he goes to school just two hours every morning. And it's crazy hard for parents. Like, you just start working and suddenly you have to go pick up your kid again. So I've been helping them. So I picked him up. And um, he's eight, and he likes every now and then to wear dresses to school. And I'm thinking, this is so cool. <laughs> this is so amazing that, I mean, first of all, first, often it's just like, is this okay? Is this okay that my little grandson wants to wear a dress? But it's so amazing what's going on now. I'm not saying it's easy for any of us as all of this kind of merges and melds and changes. But 
the fact that if a girl is called a tomboy and she feels good, you know, it's kind of cool to be called a tomboy, you know? Yeah. But a boy is called a sissy or a mama's boy, and that's an insult. What does that say about what men think about girls and women? I'm insulted if you compare me to a girl, but if a woman is compared to a dude, we feel cool. Unpack that, just think about it. And it goes all the way back to the ancient stories. So the fact that there's some fluidity now, how boys are playing, hey, I can be a strong kid, boy, and still like beautiful things. I'm so fascinated with this. Yeah, my uh, my son likes to wear all my daughter's stuff <laughs> a lot of the time, all her nightgowns and whatever. And yeah, part, yeah. he wants to be her, right? She's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's nice that, uh, you know, I, he doesn't have the type of school that would allow anything but like uniform, but whatever. Um, but just the <laughs> fact that like they can, he can paint his nails and we can have like the greatest time. And that's just the way it is. It's fantastic. I yeah, love that's, it. New. that's new. And that's also not universal in other cultures and in houses down the street. We are still under the influence of a double standard of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman and what kind of values are seen as primary. And you illustrated that so well with your support group of the 9-11 uh, survivors uh, and how even though you were like, it's okay, you can all share, I'm here, everyone's like, we're not doing that. <laughs> like, they, no matter what you did, no matter how skilled you were at eliciting feelings and confessions and all the rest, the men were too um, sort of set in their trained ways to break through all that, to be able to share the trauma that they had been through. Uh, tell me a little more about that. Yeah, well, um, I've been a teacher of mindfulness meditation for many years. And uh, after 9-11, people who had that skill, many were asked to come and help um, first responders who were having trouble uh, integrating what they had seen and experienced. And they were forced, if you can enforce mindfulness on someone, it doesn't really work, but they, they had to take these courses so they could learn better um, how to deal with their reactivity. Because, you know, when you're traumatized, your reactivity, you can get triggered very quickly. And so somebody gave money for first responders in New York City to take uh, mindfulness classes to learn how to take that pause before you react, which is what meditation is so good at teaching. So I was trying to teach mindfulness to uh, wounded warriors, guys, all guys who had were firemen uh, who had rushed into the buildings in 9-11. I loved these guys and we had a wonderful fun rapport. But as you say, um, every time I would have them, you know, often when I teach meditation, I have people start just by, put your hand here right now on your heart. And there's something very powerful just about that. Just stop, pause, and breathe. What's in there? What's in there? And there's varying degrees of, you know, some people put, put their hand on their heart and I ask what's in there and they just start to weep. Oh. Because uh, there's grief in there and we're not trained in grief. We, we've got this bizarre idea that you get one day off when your mother dies from work. Whereas in the old cultures, the women wore black for a year and they'd walk through town and they'd get great respect. Oh, she lost someone. And but now you like get over it. You know, closure, my least favorite word. Um, and so, and some people are afraid to go in there because if you go in there, uh oh, what else is in there? I maybe will cry for a year and never stop. And some people are like, feelings, wimp, get over it, you know? Like they're just gonna slow you down and confuse the matter. That's for the girls, you know, like that. 
Well, those guys were like that. I'm not going in there. I'm not talking about it. I'm supposed to get over it. And that's, that's what Tony Porter, the guy who gave the TED Talk before me, he calls that the man box. And not only men are in the man box. We're, to some extent, we've, we all suffer from patriarchy, for lack of a better word. We've all been trained. Um, and that's Cassandra's story. Cassandra uh, tried to tell the truth of what was going on, but no one believed her because she was a hysteric. So we have this mixed up idea that if you feel deeply, you're a hysteric and men don't want to be hysterics. So they lose out on so much, such depth of feeling and intimacy and all the juicy good things that are in here. So um, they're the strong and silent types. And I tried to help them feel that you could be soft and communicative and that is also powerful and good and helpful and it'll heal you. you. You'll actually get over what's bothering you quicker. And we made some progress. We made a little progress, but it's deep. It's deep inside of men and, and many women. So do you think it's like too late? I mean, what about, what about this new breed of female empathetic world changing leaders that nobody might be ready for like how does she walk into like you and you're in in your uh omega institute like how do you walk into a room full of men who aren't of the new mindset when yeah. how do you how do you affect change when you're still a minority in that sense hard but it's being done i'm super hopeful even though it looks alarming at the top right now. It looks like we have backslid back into the Neanderthal caves um, without naming names. But um, look at the women, the leaders who have handled COVID best in the world. They're women. They're Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand. They're Angela Merkel in Germany. They're in Taiwan and Finland. I think the top seven countries who've dealt the best, the least deaths, the least new infections are women. And they're in power and they're obviously doing something different because their countries are handling it different. And so, you know, in neuroscience, they talk about for years, you've heard the way humans deal with trauma and stress is flight, or fight. Those are the only two ways. But there's been a lot of new studies done on women. And there's now they're calling it tend and befriend. So there's fight and flight, but there's other ways to deal with stress too. And women have millennia of dealing with it through tending. So there's a trauma, you tend to the old, you tend to the children and befriend instead of making someone an enemy, hey, can we do this together? Can we all create a goal we want to solve? We may have different opinions, but can we move together towards something? And this is how the uh, COVID women leaders have been dealing with it by tending to the most vulnerable and befriending the different ideas of how you deal with it and trying to create a community as opposed to dividing people. And, and those studies, both the um, medical studies and the studies done sociologically in organizations about tend and be friend versus fight and flight are so fascinating. I really recommend people reading them. Interesting, I love that. Tend and be friend, well that I can do. <laughs> um, those come easy. Uh, on the writing side, um, can you tell me a little more about your process of writing the book? And then also if you have advice for aspiring authors. Mm. Um, you know, I'm the kind of writer, when I wrote my first book, I kept trying to be a different kind of writer. You know, I kept trying to write uh, what I think it was Annie Lamott calls shitty first drafts. Um, but I write sentence by sentence, word by word. I can't leave a sentence until I love it. I can't write big, huge things and then go back. And it makes for an extremely slow and tedious writing process. And I'm not a very fast writer. Um, I have, 
I, I just work those sentences. I love words. I love language. And sort of the construction of a sentence tells me a lot of what the next sentence needs to be. I, so there's a, a poetic sense to my nonfiction that um, it's the way I do it. I've tried not to do it that way because it's slow and torturous. But that's just the way I do it. And, and I keep telling myself, well, you wrote a book, so I guess you can do it this way. Um, and I, I'm, when I'm writing a book, I'm very, very disciplined and uh, other parts of my life really suffer. I like my friends don't understand me. I like disappear. And, and at the end of every book, I'm like, I am never doing that again. <laughs> Why would I do that again? And just last night I'm lying in bed thinking, well, when this virtual book tour is over, what will I do? Well, I have a book in my mind. I'm like, no, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you clearly know what you're doing. And now I can't wait to go back and read your memoir now that I was just, you know, trying to pull out all the bits of you from this. So um, you really are a beautiful writer. And uh, Thank you. I really, I underlined so many things and, um, you know, I don't, for sure, always say that. So I mean it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Any parting advice for aspiring authors? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm a nonfiction writer and I did try to write a novel once. I think probably all nonfiction writers try to write a novel. And my agent, when I showed him the first like couple of hundred pages, he, he said to me, well, your dialogue kind of sounds like a stilted civics lesson. And I was like, ouch, oh my God, <laughs> ah, run away. I put it in a drawer and I never <laughs> looked at it again. But um, so this is advice for nonfiction writers um, because I'm not a fiction writer. I, I just think people learn through stories and, and the stories people mostly learn from are not the sweet and happy and kind of aren't, isn't my life so perfect stories. They're the stories of like mistakes and, and really poor behavior and learning through just everyday crap. And I end up telling those stories. I always say the book made me do it. Um, people are like, oh, you're so brave. I'm like, no, the book made me do it. So I would just say, be brave about telling your own story because that's what we want. We want you, you know, we want you. I love that. That's great advice. Um, well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me be a part of your publication journey. I know you have so many notables interviewing you and you had Danny Shapiro uh -huh. and uh, Maria Shriver and all these great people on your tour. So you're a great people. You're a great people. <laughs> and thank you for teaching me how to do Instagram Live. I learned I can't do it on my computer. I should have put that <laughs> in now. It's my fault. Um, no, 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 no. But now you've got the hang of it. You'll know how to do it from now on. I do. I know now. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.